guess it's about time for us to get started uh, this morning. That still seems awfully loud to me. No? Okay. All right. I'll live with it. Uh, in the bulletin, if you got one, uh, or the, the announcement sheet bulletin, uh, several people have had some surgeries and things uh, in the last couple of weeks. Randy DeWall, the hip replacement, Susie Wheelock, a kneecap uh, procedure. Basically, they wire your kneecap back and they take the, the smallest part out and leave the big part in or whatever, I guess. But uh, And then Larry Don Smith, uh, how's, how's Larry Don doing? Doing better? Slowly getting better. Okay. And uh, Twyla Guy is back home from the hospital after having some blood clots in her lungs. Uh, Patty Peacock's friend, Debbie, uh, uh, Debbie from Duncan, is in the ICU with COVID at, uh, at uh, Oklahoma City at the university. That's Debbie Cowley. Um, Nicholas Unruh, Debbie Watson's cousin, is fighting fires in Oregon. And Tammy uh, Postulart, uh, which is, uh, we knew her as Tammy Dysher. Jolene's daughter had a bad cut in her finger and cut some tendons and, and had to have surgery for that. Wayne Lawson's still dealing with infections in his legs. And Al Norman um, is uh, kind of on hospice. So we need to keep them in mind. Anybody have any other prayer requests or needs? Okay, Dick Hefner finished his radiation last they week. Don't know the, they don't know the full results yet. But right. Get all the data and stuff. Was he having like weekly treatments for a while? Every week? Or taking them for about six weeks, I think. Every day, probably, for six oh, weeks? Okay, that's, that's a good thing to be He's over with. Tomorrow and the next day and see if okay. He's not, I mean, taking well, let's pray together as we get started here. Father in heaven, we're uh, thankful, God, that you are our God, that you are our Father, that you love us, that you uh, do so many things for us. And uh, we, we have some requests, God, that you be with these people that we mentioned in the bulletin, and as well as uh, with our country and with our president and first lady who have been diagnosed with COVID, and just uh, help, uh, help us all heal from this pandemic and and uh, find a way for whether it be a vaccine or a good treatment for it that, that it can be uh, shut down. We ask God that you will be with each and every one of us as we walk through life, that we'll be strong for you, that we'll live in love and, and uh, with your word. In Jesus we pray, amen. We're going to get started here. I just noticed my glasses my, my reader glasses broke, so we'll see how that works now. But, uh, um, maybe I won't need them if I stay back enough. Uh, we've been talking about the great Christian evidences and things that are going on um, in Christianity that started happening right after the church started. And in that first few centuries after the church started, uh, they came up with these great Christian doctrines, uh, and it's things that you say, okay, so they came up with these great Christian doctrines, you know, what's it worth? Well, we talked last week a little bit about how through that we can understand that Jesus had all authority, he had the ability to give some authority to the apostles, and the apostles had the authority to write, and uh, they did, and through that we have the word of God the Bible, and at the close of the word of God, the Bible that he gave, or the words that he gave through his apostles and through Jesus, he stopped talking to us. And then we are now at that time where we have to live through the word that we have to do what he would want us to do, to be what he would want us to be. And part of that is uh, we need to talk about different subjects of the Bible. And the subject we're going to start on today a little bit is uh, the subject of God. We started this class in the very beginning asking, well, who is God? 
why do we believe in him? Um, so now we're going to delve a little bit more into what Jesus and, and the Old Testament and God through the apostles has spoken to us about who he is. And so we're going to talk about God. First off, God is triune. And triune means trinity, is the way we would say it today. Um, the first person that really ever put that into words was Tertullian. And he lived around, uh, I think he was born 130 uh, after uh, Christ. Uh, so in that first century, he coined this phrase, the Trinity. The Trinity, as we know it, as we are used to saying it, is it's God, Christ, and the Holy Spirit are the Trinity, and they are one. Um, and we're going to talk a little bit about how we get to that. So in the Old Testament, it's implicitly implied that God is plural, that there's more to God than just God. In the New Tes Testament, it gets explicit talking about that. But it's not as clear in the Old Testament that it's that way. There are hints at it along the way, but it doesn't get very explicit until we get to the New Testament. Why do you think that is? From, from what we've talked about in class, why do you think that might be? Any ideas? I think that's right, Betty. I think, uh, as we talked about before, he only gave them what they could understand or what they could, could really get their teeth into and figure out at the beginning. And uh, we may not have all the answers for us ourselves and may not have them until the day we're in the presence of God uh, as well. But what we do have, it has grown from the time of the Old Testament until the New Testament. Uh, when things are proven a little more clearly. And, um, but um, I think that's probably one of the reasons that it is implicit to begin with. Well, how is it implicit? Uh, Deuteronomy 6.4 says, Hear, O Israel, the Lord our God, the Lord is one. That's the Shema. Um, the Shema is, is the thing that was kind of the, the foundation or fundamental plank that the Old Testament stood on. Hear, O Israel, the Lord is God, the Lord is one. Um, the Lord our God, the Lord is one. And if you look at Genesis 1-1, the very first verse talks about God and the word that's used for God in Genesis 1 is Elohim. Elohim is a Hebrew word that connotates plural, plurality. So that's one of those implicit ideas that, okay, it says, the rest of the time we see it as Jehovah, um, things like that, because they didn't want to say God's name. When Moses asked, who shall I say sent me? Tell them I am sent you. That's what he said his name was, as I am at that point. But uh, nevertheless, in the Jewish uh, history, they didn't want to say God's name out loud. So they, they represented it with uh, Yahweh, which is the Hebrew for Jehovah. Um, but the Elohim is the word that explains it in Genesis 1, and it is a plural word. Like there was more than, not more than one God, but God was plural for a being. Elohim is a plural for a being. Um, and then when it says in Genesis 1, let us make man, let us make man, 
What did it say before that in Genesis 1 when he was creating things? God said, let there be light. In our Bibles, you know, other than uh, let us make man, makes it more of a plural thing. The very beginning, we talked about that. God didn't, didn't create us as a creation because he was lonely, because he never was by himself. God has always been the Messiah. He's always been the Spirit. He's always been God. Okay? Has that got everybody confused? <laughs> We're going to go on a little bit. Uh, he also talks about uh, the spirit of, of Jehovah, the spirit of um, the Holy Spirit. And, and anytime there's goodness or deity that's being explained, uh, whether it's uh, Jesus or whether it's God, uh, it's kind of a theophany, uh, and it, it talks about the angel of, of Jehovah, or the angel of God, the angel of this. Um, so the doctrine in the Old Testament is implied if you know what you're looking for. But when we get to the New Testament, it changes about this Trinity idea. In the New Testament, it stresses that... Uh, as strongly as it does in the Old Testament, if not more strongly than the Old Testament about there being a trinity. Um, it's clearly taught, and in the passages that in which it is clearly taught, uh, it shows the personality of the Holy Spirit, and it shows uh, the humanity of Christ, and it shows God, the all-powerful, as well. Let's look at uh, 2 Corinthians 13, 14. And again, you might want to jot these scriptures down because there's going to be a few of them. But, uh, so you can look at them later. But 2 Corinthians 13, 14. The grace of the Lord Jesus Christ and the love of God and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit be with you all. Uh, and it, it, I think it says, may the grace of the Lord Jesus Christ and the love of God and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit be with you all in those in that verse. Um, what does that say about the Trinity? Okay, it names all three in one spot there with it. And then, then uh, let's look at Romans fifteen thirty. Now I urge you, brethren. By our Lord Jesus Christ and by the love of the Spirit to strive together with me in your prayers to God for me. That's Paul writing. Now I urge you, brethren, by our Lord Jesus Christ and by the love of the Spirit to strive together with me in your prayers to God for me. Again, we've got all three of them. In the one spot uh, there, in one verse that it talks about. Luke one thirty five, And the angel answered and said to her, The Holy Spirit will come upon you, and the power of the Most High will overshadow you. And for that reason, the holy offspring shall be called the Son of God. Who's... who's Luke one thirty five, okay. Luke one thirty five. The Holy Spirit will come over you, okay. The Holy Spirit's going to come over who? Mary. Mary. This is talking about when Mary's being told that she's going to have a child, <laughs> and she's never been with a man yet. So the Holy Spirit will come upon you, and the power of the Most High. Who's that? God. God. And the power of the Most High, or God, will overshadow you. And for that reason, the holy offspring shall be called the Son of God. Who's that? Christ. That's Jesus. That's Christ. So we've got all three involved there with it. When uh, and it was being explained to Mary what was coming.
Matthew 3, 16 through 17, Debbie's talking about. <laughs> that's fine, that's fine, that's good. Whoops, we're getting a ring. Matthew 3, 16 and 17, and after being, oh, you got to turn me down or something, it's going to really buzz in a minute. Okay. And after being baptized, Jesus went up immediately from the waters, and behold, the heavens were opened, and he saw the Spirit of God descending as a dove and coming upon him, and behold, a voice out of heaven saying, This is my beloved Son, in whom I am well pleased. Okay, the, the dove is the Holy Spirit, Jesus is the one being baptized, and the voice out of heaven saying, this is my beloved Son, in whom I am well pleased. The Son of God. The Holy Offspring. It sounds like this is a message to Jesus, because he said he looked up and he saw it. It's coming. Because I mean, it was to the people around, too. But Jesus could tell from that that he was doing what God wanted him to do. Yeah. Yeah, we all kind of like the affirmation from our dads when we got it, didn't we? And probably all of us dads don't give it enough to our kids. <laughs> the affirmation or the praise or the... First Peter 1 and 2. This is another spot where we have the three being talked about. It said, according to the foreknowledge of God, the Father... By the sanctifi sanctifying work of the Spirit, that you may obey Jesus Christ and be sprinkled with his blood, may grace and peace be yours in, full, in the fullest measure. So let me read that again. According to the foreknowledge of God the Father, by the sanctifying work of the Spirit, that you may obey Jesus Christ and be sprinkled with his blood, may grace and peace be yours in fullest measure. That's Peter speaking. And that's, I think, his uh, uh, salutation there that he's talking to the people. And uh, he's talking about the Father, the Spirit, and Christ. And uh, it's one of those things when he says uh, that, uh, that you may obey Jesus Christ and be sprinkled with his blood. A lot of the uh, different versions have a footnote on that, and the commentators talk about that uh, you obey Jesus Christ and be sprinkled by his blood or with his blood as being cleansed by his blood. It, it was the, the way of connotating at that time about his blood dripping from the cross as he was crucified and how that sprinkling blood was cleansing the people. Um, I think we jump on it and think, well, is that talking about sprinkling as a baptism? Yeah, that's, that could be confusing for some people. Right, and I'm sure that some people use it that way. Uh, but apparently in the connotation that Peter is talking, that's not, he's not substituting sprinkling as baptism. He's talking about the cleansing that came from that blood as it was shed on the cross and sprinkled there. Okay. But But you, beloved, building yourselves up on your most holy faith, praying in the Holy Spirit, keep yourselves in the love of God, writing anxiously, uh, waiting anxiously for the mercy of our Lord Jesus Christ to eternal life. So again, he's talking about praying in the Holy Spirit, keeping yourselves in the love of God, and waiting anxiously for the mercy of our Lord Jesus Christ to eternal life. Again, the triune is explicitly named 
in, in all of these. Then Matthew 28, 19. Go therefore and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit. Um, so these are, are, are things that make it a little clearer <coughs> about the Trinity of God, the plurality of God um, that uh, has come up. There are some other readings you can look at uh, if you're so interested you might jot these down if you want to, if you want to ever go to the library and try to look them up or online look them up. Uh, the International Standard Bible Encyclopedia talks about the Trinity quite a bit. And uh, Volume 2, Articles on the Godhead, and Volume 5, Articles on the Trinity, um, are in that International Standard Bible Encyclopedia. And then at uh, lectureships at, at uh, Abilene Christian College in 1958, uh, B.B. Baxter gave talk on the Godhead and the Trinity of it. So those are just some other things that uh, if you so choose, you can look those up and, and uh, learn more about that. Then there were denials to the idea of uh, the Trinity. And the Ebonites were the first century disagreeers. They, they wouldn't accept Paul's writings, so they got rid of a lot of these verses about the Trinity. Uh, they just wouldn't accept his writing because apparently they didn't accept him as an apostle uh, as, as possibly the reason. Uh, but they became non-existent by uh, 350 A.D. Uh, so that was a group of people at, at that time that uh, would not uh, agree to the idea that, uh, that God had his three. What, what did you call them? The Ebonites. E-B-I-O-N-I-T-E. Then we talked before about Arius, uh, who was uh, uh, a elder in the church in 318 A.D. at Alexandria. And uh, he, he said there was a time that uh, the Logos was not, that, that God created the Logos before he created anything else, before he created the world. And so he was a separate part uh, and not really part of the Godhead. And then we talked about Athenius. Athanasius uh, was the deacon who voiced complaints against him, and then the government got involved, and then they had the Nicene Council to try to settle this rift. Um, uh, the uh, Nicene Council felt in the favor of the deacon and not the elder that there is a trinity. And Salcinius is an Italian theologian in 1539 to 1604. He uh, uh, did not believe in the Trinity and voiced his opinion. And he was a, somewhat of a contemporary of uh, Calvin and Luther, um, the ones that uh, had started some of the stuff. At Lawton. At Lawton. Okay, I thought they were still there, uh, but they don't believe in the, the Trinity. Uh, and they don't believe that those verses are pointing to that. Um, does anybody have any doubts that those verses are talking about the Trinity in the New Testament? Or are we just trying to talk ourselves into something? It's John and there and then in, 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 in form, in physical form, and then his spirit that does everything. So. You know, it's kind of hard for us to understand the Trinity. It's hard to wrap your head around that idea. Um, my simplistic mind, and this is way too simple to explain it, is that, uh, you know, I am, I am a son, I am a father, I am an uncle, I am a doctor, uh, I'm somewhat of a carpenter. Uh, you know, there's a lot of things I am. But I can't say that I am is my name. My God could. But when he says, who, who do I say sent me? Tell him I am sent you. That kind of covers it all. You know, and we'll get into that some more about the attributes of God as we go on here a little bit. Um, 
Any questions about this at this point? Anything? If not, let's go ahead and talk about those attributes, attributes the metaphysical attributes of God. Uh, who is he? Or, you know, how, what can he do? What can he not do? And that sort of thing. And uh, the guy that, Dr. Telsey, that was teaching this class when I took it for a semester at OC, he also was at the ACC lectureships in 1958, and he did a, a presentation beyond the presence of God. And I, I bet you'd probably enjoy that if you looked that up. Um, I don't have a copy of that uh, with me at all, but uh, uh, he talks about the divinity of God. That's the absence of limitation. Absence of limitation. Uh, Psalms 145 and 5 says, Great is our God and abundant in strength. His understanding is infinite. Infinite means what exactly? Is <laughs> that's a good question because that's one of the points. That's part of what he is. We, we don't have a good way to explain what. No end. Yeah. No end. It's like eternity. No beginning, no end. It just is. And infinite knowledge is something that we can't understand. <laughs> we can't really put it into a good word or a good definition. And everything we try to do is, is, is not good enough to really explain what it is. Uh, we don't have an analogy in man about what that is. But part of that is that he is omnipresent. We've heard that before. Uh, God is not limited by time or space, either in concept or in reality. He's not, he's not limited to time or space. I have often wondered and thought about how many times of all the prayers that go up to God constantly, you know, but he, he gets it. Yeah, the older we get, the harder that is. You, know, you, just, you just can't. The TV's going, and Chris is talking to me in the bed next to me, and is saying something. I have to, huh, what? You yeah. know, and, and turn that off and turn my head this way to hear and stuff. So, yeah, yeah, but he, he is. He's not, he's not restrained by time or space. There are two units in existence, two things in existence. There's God and the universe. Was that a question? I get, didn't understand what you said. There, there are two things in existence. There's God and there's the universe. Or in other words, there's God and there's everything else. And one permeates the other. God permeates the universe. God is everywhere everything else is. And, and then, you know, I've often, you know, wondered about that, say that God sees you all the time, knows you all the time, he's there all the time, but what about on the other side of the earth? You know, for a start, if he knows and sees me all the time, how can he know and see people over there all the time? You know, well, he is not limited to time or space. And we can't understand that. You know, we don't, we don't get that in, in a full way to explain it anyway. He fills everything. So in Acts 17, 27, it says they, that they should seek God if perhaps they might grope for him and find him, though he is not far from each one of us. He's not only where he can see me, he, I'm part of the universe. He's through me. He permeates me. God never needs to move to another place to be able to get closer to you. He never moves to get closer to a place he needs to work. He's already there. There isn't a way to get any closer 
closer to God than you are right now. Any one of you. We can't physically get closer to God than where we are right now. And everybody out there on the whole globe is in the same position. Because God is omnipresent. He permeates us. Permeates it all. Um, that's just a mind-blowing idea. Look at Jeremiah 23 to 24. Jeremiah 23, 24. Can a man hide himself in hiding places so I do not see him declares the Lord. Do I not fill the heavens and the earth, declares the Lord. That's why Jonah couldn't hide from God. Jonah eating all of it. Okay, 1 Kings. 1 Kings 8, 27. This is Solomon's prayer to God when he was building the temple. And in that prayer he says in verse 27, but will God indeed dwell on the earth? Behold, heaven and the highest heaven cannot contain thee. How much less this house which I have built. It's so hard for us to, to really think about how much he is everywhere. How much the highest of highest of heavens, wherever that is. When we look at the telescope, we look out at the universe, and he's there. He is omnipresent. He is there and permeates everything. Uh, John 4, 24. God is spirit, and those who worship him must worship in spirit and truth. I think that's kind of one of those things where he's reminding us that he is all these things that we can't define. He's infinite. He's omnipresent. He knows all. He is all. He permeates all. He is spirit, and those who worship him must worship him in spirit and in truth. We use that a lot of times to talk about how we have to to be sure that we're teaching everything in truth and that we've got it right and that we're doing everything that we can to have all the knowledge that we can have to teach and do it and say it. And, and we'll never be able to get to that point that God is. We've lived that all true. You know, this, this stuff that we've been talking about in this class, it, it's it's kind of deep stuff. Um, you know, it's really deep as far as you have a full, true understanding of all of it. I don't know that we can. But the fact of the matter is, if we get down and have all our, our T's crossed and our I's dotted and everything else, and if we're just standing here cramming that stuff and don't have the heart to reach out to others, we're worthless. We're worthless to God. And it, you know, I, I hope that this never comes off as something that knows all answers or it's got to be this way or the highway um, in one sense because, uh, you know, we tend, we're tending to lose people. We're tending to lose people um, toward Christianity. And I hope that we will always have the heart and the love to make Christianity palatable and not legalistic to the point that, that they don't want to hear it. Because God is love. Through all of this, God is love. And we, we have to be careful about that when we say it, I think. Um, the, the chapter of Psalms 139 talks about the greatness of God and where he is and stuff. I, I'm not going to take the time to read that because uh, it's a fairly long chapter. But read Psalm 139 maybe when you get home today. Uh, some passages seem to uh, contradict 
what we say about God being everywhere all the time because it is a manifestation of God, um, like the, in the burning bush. Well, if he's in the burning bush, how can he be at the other end of the universe? You know, that kind of thing. Well, a lot of this is, is for us to be able to understand it, putting it in language that we can understand uh, some of these other attributes of him. He's spoken of sometimes as figuratively, uh, to, in accommodating language, putting it in language that we can understand, and in anthropomorphic language, or that which is putting God with human feelings, making God a man form. Does that sound familiar? God a man form? Jesus is really anthropomorphic. I got them all right there. Anthropomorphic. Uh, because he came and he was God in man form. James 4 8. Draw near to God and he will draw near to you. Cleanse your hands, you sinners, and purify your hearts, you double minded. Draw to God, he will draw near to you. We just got through saying he's already there. But it's to get us to understand. The only way we can feel closer to God is to draw near to Him. And He's there. Ephesians 2.17 And He came and preached peace to you who were far away and peace to those who were near. And then one more I'm going to give you is Acts 2.39 for, for the promise is for you and your children and for all who are far off as many as the Lord our God shall call to himself. So, God is here. He's omnipresent. He permeates everything. He's with us. We don't have to go far to find him. He'll be there. And that's, that's the best I can say about his omnipresence. We're going to go on to omniscience next week. Uh, I think it's time to stop, is it not? Okay. All right. So we'll, we'll go on with his omniscience next week and uh, go from there. Omniscience is all knowledge, if, if you're wondering for sure what that is, all knowledge. Faye, did you have a question? No? Okay. All right. Well, thank you for uh, staying with me with it.